thank you for coming, everybody. This is a really good turnout. We're excited to have you here. To tell you a little bit about something exciting that we're doing. Um, you may have heard about the I-6 challenge. It's a large grant opportunity. Pretty much every stakeholder in the region came together and supported this. And today we're going to talk about what's going to happen as a result and how it's going to benefit our community and how you can participate. So thanks again for coming, and I'm going to turn things over. Well, first, I want to acknowledge our E1 partners in the room. Could you all raise your hand if you're an E1 partner? These folks are all part of this. They have come from across all of Southeast Minnesota to support us. So please, round of applause. For the and secondly, panelists, which includes E1 partners and others. Could you raise your hand if you're a panelist? Please, applause for the panelists. Moving on, I would like to introduce Lily Shaw, who's here from St. Paul, yep. but she's part of a bigger company that is national, working on a national effort around startups. She's going to tell you about Startup Space, who's one of our partners. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. So my name is Lily Shaw. I live in uh, St. Paul, but I'm originally from uh, Southeast. I'm from Mankato, Minnesota. So I have uh, definitely lived in uh, a smaller community and love smaller communities. Um, currently, who I work with is Startup Space. Startup Space is an entrepreneurial ecosystem building platform. It is a tool for entrepreneurs and for organizations to be able to connect together, to be able to communicate, um, to ask questions, to be able to list resources for entrepreneurs, to be able to filter and find the things they need through a mapped ecosystem and it is a place for them to be able to find events especially with um, the E1 partners that are spread out into so many different areas it is a way to interconnect you guys into one space where an entrepreneur in Mankato or an entrepreneur in Rochester or an entrepreneur in Winona could go into this app or on a desktop and be able to say hey does anybody have an idea of an accountant that would be able to give me information about how to do my taxes? I'm a new entrepreneur. Or does I have an idea? Does anybody know where I can go? And it is a space where somebody could answer them. It is a space where they could peruse um, all of you, all of the partners that we have here that have placed your resources on there, a place where somebody could explore on how to get to Collider, on how to get to Red Wing Ignite and knowing that they can come here to work in a co-working space. But the real thing I want to reveal about Startup Space is that we are a startup. We started uh, by an entrepreneur who was looking for uh, resources in his community, and he couldn't find them. And so he started putting them all in one place 19 months ago. And now, 19 months later, with over 10,000 entrepreneurs on the platform in 150 cities, 75 hubs, we call them, you are a hub. A hub is a space where you are in a safe space where you can interconnect together. And uh, with over 3,458 resources across the country in 19 months. And we are growing, and we are iterating, and we are learning from all of you on how to tell our story and how to support you. Because ultimately what our passion is, is to make sure that entrepreneurs get to what they want. Because as we all know, it doesn't just take luck to be a successful entrepreneur. It takes connections, it takes support, it takes connectivity, and it takes access to the right resources. So as an open access platform, we are here to support you. I am here to hear your feedback, your struggles on, I don't know what this is about, how do I get on here? I don't know how, where do I go? How do I do this? We want to hear from you because we want to support you and we want to make it the best experience so entrepreneurs can have the best success and they can, they can learn faster, iterate sooner, and get to be where they want to be. So thank you for your time today. I am over here to answer any questions that you have, to show you how to download the app, to show you how to access the things that you need, to take your feedback, to get your understanding about what it is. So please come see me when you have time. I appreciate all of you, and thank you for being here tonight. Thanks, Lily. Next, I'd like to introduce another partner of ours who's leading our effort for the Startup School. This is a new effort to bring 
uh, entrepreneurial education to Red Wing and to this region. This partner is called ILT Studios, and Nick Teets is over here. He's going to come over and talk about the program. I'm a little slow today, guys. <laughs> Nick broke his ankle yesterday. Yeah. Oh, uh, don't feel bad. I was playing against 15 year old girls. <laughs> um, so I coach, uh, I coach uh, uh, my daughter's soccer team, and uh, we have a lot of fun, but you're getting a little, a little uh, you're having too much fun. So, uh, my name's Nick. Um, I'm an innovator and entrepreneur. I help discover and develop assets and activate people and ideas. Um, I and my team, we've created a new company called ILT Studios, and we are a startup studio. Um, our goal is to build a thousand companies over the next 10 years uh, in rural areas serving underestimated entrepreneurs and underserved geographies. Uh, we have created this studio. We have our first one that we're standing up in St. Cloud. Uh, we're been partnering closely with uh, Great North Labs to try to uh, cultivate and create more of a culture and a community of entrepreneurship because we believe that in order for us to create more growth engines to get more entrepreneurs going, we need to act like a giant startup, which means we need to talk every day about what it is that we're doing. We need to practice pitching our ideas. We need to practice sharing our ideas because we don't believe that ideas are the secret. We think that the secret actually is the entrepreneur or the founder. And we believe that if we got more reps and practice at being an entrepreneur or a founder, that we'd have an opportunity in this state to get more great startups going. Um, with that thought, we uh, started working closely with uh, Red Wing Ignite to develop uh, this new program, the Red Wing Ignite uh, Lean Startup School. And we have our first classes um, that are going to be coming up, starting with customer-driven innovation. Uh, we think that Lean Startup is critical to getting into the execution mode, but one of the things that we believe is very important is that you understand how to break down a problem and an opportunity for the customer and the context with, with in that it exists, right? If you know how to break that down, you'll know how to diagnose any startup, not even your own, but you'll be able to start working with other entrepreneurs. You might even find yourself mentoring somebody the next week, because now you understand what that process is. So what I would love for all of you to leave today knowing that if you want to uh, come to this class, learn this process, uh, we have some really great instructors, uh, myself included, uh, David Newen and Shelby Collette. Um, we are going to be teaching this process. We want as many people to know about it as possible. Uh, in Red Wing on the uh, 314, we'll have a two and a half hour session at 9 a.m. and we'll have another session at 1. In St. Cloud, again on the 7th, uh, 9 a.m. and 1 p.m. We would love it if you shared it with as many people as possible that want to understand how to break down an idea. You don't need a fully baked idea. You don't have to have the whole thing figured out. We just want you to come into the room with something that you've been thinking about. We'll show you how to analyze the opportunity, assess it, and hopefully you'll walk away with an idea that you want to go uh, do a startup. Now the one thing that I want to add is that you can see there's a, there's a bunch of scribbles on the right hand side. It's my scribbles. Um, is that we have a follow-on course, uh, the Lean Startup, where we will be breaking down that Lean Startup process. Now, there's a lot of information about the Lean Startup. What we want to do, though, is give you an opportunity to practice and learn from other practitioners, with a mentor, and really work on that idea and figure out how to validate it before you go spend the rest of your life trying to, trying to make your dream happen. And so, if this is something that you're interested in learning more about, and uh, building a startup, uh, we'd love to have you come. And there's a lot of great information that Adam and the team here will tell you about. Um, there's some prizes and there's some dollars at the end for people that make it all the way through the process. So, yeah. So, yeah. And I should say that it's entirely free. You just have to get yourself to the class. Yes. And there'll be snacks. So you can thank you for this. <laughs> <laughs> snacks and drinks. So thank you, man. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, who is from Cori. Cori is the Center on Rural Innovation, which is based on the East Coast. And they're the group that originally came to Red Wing and identified us as a community to help apply for a large federal grant, which we did receive. So to give you some ideas and statistics on this, there were about 110 different communities they were looking at. They selected nine to help apply. And then we received 
grant, and we were one of three. So three out of 110 that they identified as high potential communities across the United States. And so they called us up one day. And we said, well, how did you find us? And they said, well, we've been here about you all over the internet. And we said, wow. So I want to say thanks to Neil Malgar, right back there. And all the Years of hard work that Neela put in, and Shannon, and everyone else involved, that's what led CORE to find us, and that's why we're here today with all these resources, and obviously all of our stakeholders have, have supported us as well. So, without further ado, I'll introduce Mark. So, first, I just want to congratulate everybody here, especially Red Wing Ignite, but really all the E1 communities for coming together to get uh, to apply for and receive the I6 grant. Um, I can tell you it is an extremely difficult grant to win. Um, our organization somewhat exists because the Economic De Development Administration that gives out the grant felt like they weren't getting too many rural communities applying uh, because it's such a difficult grant to, to uh, put together. So they uh, contracted us to provide technical assistance to rural communities. So we are well aware of what a difficult challenge this is. Um, and so really, uh, congratulations on putting in the hard work to get it done. So um, Corey is a nonprofit organization and was really founded um, to address the issues that um, we see in rural America today. So really going back, um, you know, the story I think of, of some of the challenges that rural communities face goes back many decades, but just if we look at the last 10 years or so, um, rural communities have really uh, fallen behind the rest of the country in terms of economic prosperity. Um, and so this has had significant reper repercussions on rural communities. Um, students are more likely to leave rural communities if they have, rural, uh, uh, if they have student debt. Uh, rural communities have a lower rate of college, attain college uh, attainment than urban counterparts, and um, they have a 45% higher uh, drug-related death rate. And so um, this trend we worry is going to continue um, largely due to the effects of automation. So um, rural places compared to urban places are more vulnerable to the effects of automation, which means that uh, many of the companies that serve as the foundation of rural communities today, we think are going to be less likely to add as many jobs to the future as they have in the past because of automation. Um, we also think that this changes the dynamics of economic development in rural places, that the dynamics of uh, relying on industrial recruitment to supply new jobs in a rural area um, is going to be harder and harder and harder in the future. Um, and so uh, it's important for, for rural communities to, to look at new approaches to development. And then a really critical approach, uh, which I know everybody agrees with in this room, is that entrepreneurship needs to play an important role in any rural development strategy. Um, and, and the troubling fact is that uh, if we look at rates of entrepreneurship in rural communities over time, um, they've been declining, uh, both in absolute terms, but also relative to, to urban counterparts. And one big reason for this, we think, is that rural communities have really been left out of the capital systems that are driving economic growth in our country today. So um, an amazing stat that 75% of VT, VC investment in 2016 went to just three, three states, and only 1% went to rural places. And this is in the, the context of one of the longest periods of economic expansion in our history. And so a big reason why, the, uh, why rural communities haven't been able to take part in the digital economy is that they've lagged the rest of the country in terms of access to a critical component to the digital economy, which is broadband. And, you know, the, the, since the economy has really been driven by digital jobs over the last 10 or 20 years, um, it's created a dynamic where rural communities have fallen further and further behind. 
But even though there are a lot of challenges, we're still optimistic about rural America, and then we think there's evidence to back that up. Um, there was a great report from, uh, a great poll from Gallup that the Washington Post wrote about, which asked Americans um, where they would prefer to live in relation to where they live today. And uh, what we found very encouraging was that um, a large, you know, 27% of respondents said they would prefer to live in a rural area. Um, while only 15% live in rural areas today. So there's desire to live in rural places. Um, there's been uh, a big push to expand access to broadband in recent years. Um, so more than 2,500 communities across the country have fiber internet. Um, and then recent changes um, to the tax code and the introduction of opportunity zones create new programs to finance uh, companies and high growth are in, in rural areas. So the convergence of these three factors to us suggests there's great opportunity. But as I mentioned, we believe that rural communities have to adopt a different strategy if they're going to take advantage of these opportunities and really integrate into the digital economy. And so uh, we think that that strategy is built around sort of three components. Uh, a digital ecosystem, an innovation hub, and then a network that provides virtual scale that brings, that allows resources and ideas and deal flow to uh, be shared across a network of rural communities. <coughs> so when we think about the ecosystem, for us, the desired outcome are high quality digital employment driven by local entrepreneurship. And we think there are sort of five drivers of that that every rural community should be thinking about in terms of cultivating a thriving ecosystem. That's access to, to capital, especially risk capital, access to digital jobs, both within the community and through remote work, entrepreneurship support and incubation, co-working, networking, and social spaces, and digital workforce development and support. And in order to provide these things successfully, we think there's a set of foundational elements that every community also has to be paying attention to to create the conditions for the digital ecosystem to emerge, which are the things that all of us, I think, would probably want in our community. Public safety, attractive downtown, culture, broadband infrastructure, access to higher education, thriving K-12 schools, and leadership from both the public, private, nonprofit sectors. So when we work with communities, these are the things that we tend to focus on in helping them develop strategies around um, particularly these direct drivers. <coughs> but we find that successful communities often bring these things together through an innovation hub. And we see these innovation hubs sort of taking on a consistent pattern in the way they're formatted. So they're typically historic downtown buildings. They're mixed use, so they have arts and cultural amenities on the first floor. The second floor often has an entrepreneurship center, a job training and skilling center. And then at the top are housing options for young professionals. Um, and so this, when combined with access to higher education, broadband, and financing can serve as the focal point for an ecosystem to really drive it forward. So I wanted to share quickly an example from one of our other communities um, to hopefully spark some new ideas and offer you guys some inspiration. Um, so uh, the one I'm going to talk about is Cape Girardeau, Missouri. Um, I think you could probably just get on a boat and probably take the river down to Cape Girardeau if you want to visit. Um, so we've been working with them since 2008. They have a population of uh, almost 38,000, um, but a, have, has an economy that's really been lagging. So 26% of the population is below the poverty line, a median income of only 49,000, um, and still by 2017 hadn't fully recovered from the Great Recession. Their employment was still 6% lower in 2017 than it was before the Great Recession. So one way that they have really advanced their um, entrepreneurship ecosystem forward, their digital entrepreneurship ecosystem forward, was through the establishment of the Marquette Tech District. 
Um, so this started as a large private sector driven redevelopment project of their downtown where they took the historic Marquette Towers and renovated it into a mixed use um, building that provides uh, restaurants and is anchored by a co-working space called Codify, um, which takes up 17,000 square feet of the building. Um, 10,000 of it is devoted to incubating um, startup tech businesses, and the rest is used as co-working space and education space. So they've taken a really uh, innovative approach to uh, digital skills development building on the Codify co-working space. So they've launched a, a program called Code Labs One, which is a 20 week intensive uh, training in the fundamentals of coding. Uh, so people come in, they go through this training, uh, it's, every, it's four nights a week, and then um, at the end of the program they, they have uh, uh, an event which helps match the talent that comes out of the program with local employers. So it's become a really effective pipeline for building digital skills and connecting them with local employers. Um, but they also recognize that getting the workforce of the future really starts at an earlier age. So they created a program called the Youth Coding League, which is a competitive coding uh, after school program for middle schoolers, where they do a series of sprints throughout a semester that culminate in a large competitive coding tournament. Um, and they currently have 40, more than 40 schools in Missouri participating in the league. And then finally, uh, they have sort of three main programs that they, that they run to support entrepreneurs. So first is a program called the First 50K, which is a program, uh, it's a startup competition uh, that provides $50,000 grants uh, with no equity requirement to uh, promising high growth startups in the region. <coughs> Uh, they also run an accelerator for the Digital Innovation Fund, which is a 12-week program uh, for 20 early stage startups coming throughout the Delta region. Um, and then uh, they were one of the other I6 recipients last year, and so they're using their I6 to develop the Rural Delta Tech Innovation Network. So um, they are expanding uh, their uh, service area from uh, southeast uh, Missouri into Western Kentucky and Southern Illinois. So I share this as an example of, um, you know, I think one of the challenges that we, we, we encounter in, in working with rural communities is it can often feel like we're alone in this. The struggles are ours, nobody else is doing this. Um, and uh, in fact, you know, one of the amazing things about my job is I get to work with our amazing network of communities and see that across rural America, there are really innovative and exciting things happening. Um, and I'll be sure to, I'll, in my next community talk, I'll be sure to share Red Wing and um, Minnesota's story uh, about the great things you guys are doing. So, uh, you know, in order to support all of these communities we work with, we're building a network. And it's, it's, it's interesting, I feel like, um, we, our, our models are, are, are very closely aligned, and, and I really give credit to um, all the participants in E1 to really see the value of taking a networked approach to supporting a digital economy ecosystem. Because um, one of the challenges that rural communities face is they don't have scale. And we know uh, that scale plays a critical role in supporting the digital economies of New York and Boston and San Francisco. So the best thing we can do without becoming those places and becoming places of millions of people is to build virtual scale through networks. And so what you're doing here, uh, we're replicating at a national level with 20 communities across the country. And we are sort of focusing on a three-pronged approach to uh, supporting those communities and supporting uh, the development of, of ecosystem leaders. So first, focusing on uh, filling local capacity gaps by providing um, community capacity for development, uh, TA for, for grant applications, peer-to-peer -peer networking across communities, uh, workforce training, uh, entrepreneurship coaching and mentoring, and help with help for communities find place making and really focusing on the fundamental elements that support a 
thriving ecosystem. Um, we're also trying to increase access to resources for the communities in our network. Um, so creating opportunities for communities to tap into um, remote work, help their digital workforce tap into remote work opportunities outside of their region, um, making direct investments in communities through our seed fund, um, building connections to capital, uh, leveraging our national networks that are um, tapped into the venture capital systems in both Boston, New York, and San Francisco, and using that as a way of bringing attention to the entrepreneurs in our network communities to those coastal investors. Um, bringing in access to expertise on things like uh, 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 on legal issues that, that startups often face, um, patent search, things like that, uh, and helping communities expand broadband where they still have gaps in their communities. And then finally, we're focused on really changing the narrative about what's possible in rural communities. Um, I think one of the challenges that we face, I'm sure you face this in your community, from people who think this is impossible, and I think we see it at the national level, that many people don't believe there are high growth tech startups in rural America. And we have the evidence to show that that's not true because we work with those community, those entrepreneurs through our network, and we want to use that experience to help tell the story on the national level. Um, we also have a mapping and data program, which we're using to connect those stories to actual data to help us and policymakers better identify where there are either thriving or potential digital economy ecosystems across rural America. So we're providing a whole range of these resources and supports to our 20 network communities, uh, and we're continuing to grow our network um, with the goal of hopefully having 60 communities in our network uh, in the next three years. And so, you know, to us, the network, as I mentioned, the, the value of the network is really the way that it creates a virtual scale, uh, which is exactly what you guys are doing with E1. Um, so, you know, it, it has the benefit of having proven best practices that can be utilized across the network, which um, helps build trust with those who um, you, you ultimately have to engage with, your key stakeholders. So, potential entrepreneurs, employers, and VCs. When they see you adopting proven practices, they're more likely to buy into what you're doing. Um, another key part, a piece of the network for us is the, the, the way it creates deal flow. So when we think about how can we help bring capital to rural communities in our network, when we go talk to potential investors, we can say, look, we're drawing from entrepreneurs of 20 communities across the country. You would probably never look at any of those communities on your own, but by creating that deal flow, we're able to bring attention to the, uh, the opportunities across the network. And the more communities we have in, and the more deal flow we have, the more capital we think we can bring to support entrepreneurs. Um, you know, research, <coughs> resources and opportunities can be shared to strengthen. Um, everybody in the network, so uh, the Lean Startup School is a great example of how um, you know, through the network everybody can get access to a really valuable resource. And then um, you know, by bringing this network to the attention of national policymakers, national media, um, we can really bring attention to and highlight the amazing work that's going on in places um, like Red Wing and, and Southern Minnesota. Um, to, to really raise your profile and uh, help others understand and appreciate the impact that you're having. And we think doing this can really enable communities to benefit from a thriving digital economy. And you know, what that produces is uh, an increase in wealth uh, through entrepreneurship in your community, uh, the development of a strong digital workforce that is equipped to uh, to meet the needs of employers today and into the future, and then hopefully uh, a thriving community that's creating jobs, growing in population, attracting young families, all the things that we would hope that a thriving rural economy would achieve. So in terms of what we've done so far, uh, we have 20 net communities in our network. Uh, our communities have raised more than $6 million in matching funds and funds from uh, the EDA. 
Uh, we built a data set or, or a database of uh, data on rural America that includes more than 300 data sources um, and continues to grow every day as we uh, leverage that data to identify and understand what it takes to have a thriving digital ecosystem. Um, we've done 30 speaking engagements uh, just last year and used those as a platform to tell the stories of our network communities. Um, we were working with six communities on broadband expansion. Um, we visited, we spent more than 100 days traveling across the country to our rural community networks. Um, and we built a seed fund uh, of more than $2 million and invested in two companies. And, you know, again, part of, the what, part of our sort of uh, approach is to leverage our position as a national organization to bring in resources that we can then deploy out to our network. So uh, we draw from uh, a really wide range of partners who are supporting our work, uh, that are providing us resources that we're able to then deploy to support our network communities. Now I mentioned our opportunity, rural opportunity map. This is sort of the public facing version of our uh, data analysis work. You're welcome to uh, check it out on our website, which is ruralinnovation.us. Um, and it's an, it, it provides a way to um, uh, both look at the features of your community, but also to compare it to other similar communities to explore where you're similar and where you're different. And then uh, our Cori Innovation Fund uh, just closed in January, the first round. Um, so uh, we have 2.7 million raised to date, nine investors. Um, we've looked at over 100 companies already. Uh, we just made our first investment in January. I think we're about to make and announce our second investment any day now. Our first was in a company called Proximity, uh, which is based in Colorado and provides uh, co-working um, uh, it provides software to manage co-working spaces. Um, and, you know, again, we're, we're trying to get out into every um, venue that we can in the media to tell the story of the possibilities of rural America and the stories of our communities so that they can receive the national attention that they deserve. Um, but we recognize that there's still a lot to do. Uh, we still have a lot of work. You have a lot of work, we have a lot of work to continue to change um, the expectations of what's possible in rural America. So in terms of what we're going to be doing um, moving forward, so we're continuing to expand our innovation network. Uh, we're continuing to raise funds for our Opportunity Zone Fund. We're hoping to have five million by the end of the year. Um, we're partnering with Brookings and the Wall Street Journal on um, some research and thought leadership pieces to, to help shift the narrative. Um, we're working with communities on fiber development. Um, we're uh, providing access to digital skills training through Flatiron, a partner of ours, um, to help people build, help our ecosystem leaders build their <coughs> digital workforce. And, um, we're working on developing a model for connecting our network communities to national employers that are looking for distributed digital workers. So, um, you know, thank you again. Thank you for all of your hard work and the amazing things that you're doing. And, you know, I think together we really can show the world that rural communities can uh, enjoy 21st century prosperity with the rest of the country. Thanks. Talk about your background in, in rural areas and what got you interested in sure, this yeah. before you finish. So um, I'm originally from a small town in Ohio <laughs> called Wilmington, Ohio, which is in between Cincinnati and Columbus. Um, I, like most young people from my community, left as soon as I could. After I graduated from college, I went to school in Philadelphia. And then uh, after I graduated, I was about to go to rural Ecuador for the, with the Peace Corps to do economic development when the largest employer in my town left. Um, and created a massive economic crisis. Uh, it was a loss of 10,000 jobs in 2008. Um, so I ended up coming back and uh, decided to try to uh, 
try to bring new ideas for economic development to the community um, in contrast to the initial response, which was let's, uh, let's fill the basket, which you know, we lost a, the eggs, or one egg in our basket, so let's try to get another egg and put it in. Um, so, uh, so for 10 years, I worked in the community looking at a wide range of approaches to uh, retaining and building wealth from the community. Um, and in that process, got very interested in why some rural communities thrive and some don't. And so uh, that led me to go back to school. And I did a PhD at Ohio State in regional economics with a focus on rural development. Um, and so, you know, coming to joining Corey was a way to apply uh, both the experience working in a very challenging rural environment uh, in a community facing large job losses and trying to figure out a new strategy for prosperity. Uh, and then uh, sort of seeing rural development from the 100,000 foot scale as an economist and, and understanding, you know, what, what do we know about what works and what don't we know about what works and what can we still discover. And so um, it's exciting for me to get to be in a position where I get to work with so many communities, both because it's so exciting to, um, to support the amazing work that you all are doing, but also for me as a, uh, as a student of rural development to uh, understand all the ways in which communities are different and what are the things that really uh, they're doing that make their ecosystems work. So, and I think we hope to continue to contribute to the evidence base on this so that um, others across the country have a better sense of what it takes to build a thriving rural economy in the 21st century.